uh, okay, okay. I think it should work now. Yep, okay. Perfect. Yep, yep. Yeah, I do. Yep, cool. Okay. is go first so that like if we're bad then everyone else is good and if we're good then everyone else has to stress about it and we don't. Yep. Yep. Maybe. No offense. Okay. I feel pretty confident in everyone. Yeah, that's so nice. <laughs> have to speak into this microphone for the stream to be able to hear you. So anyone who's speaking has to speak into the microphone, okay? <laughs> so welcome everyone here and everyone online. I think there's four people, sweet. Um, so just a little brief introduction for the Green Program. For anyone watching online is we're an experiential uh, education program for students to learn about sustainability in Iceland and over the past eight days all the students here have come up with some really cool innovative projects in an entrepreneurial setting that they're going to present for us today uh, and for the those of you here I want you to just reflect back and think about where you are right now and like how far you've come in this project um, and I'm really excited to hear your presentations uh, so first up is the small scale sustainable energy system a school based approach? And I'm gonna make this one too. Oh. I forgot to describe how it would work. It's 15 minute presentation and then five minutes <laughs> for questions. Sound good? And I'll give you a notification like I'll tell you when you have five, three, and then one minute left in your presentation. Ready to go? Yeah. All right. Welcome to our presentation. Today we're going to be talking about small scale sustainable energy systems, a school based approach. All right. So we'll begin with our golden circle. So the reason that we created this project was to address the issue of underfunded schools in low income areas in the US. So these schools don't uh, have the proper funding to buy necessary resources, and they also don't have access to clean energy generation or green education. So to remedy the situation, we plan to create opportunities for sustainable power use and environmental education. So we aim to do this by facilitating the installation and continued use of a solar energy system and providing sustainability curriculum to an underfunded school that we've selected in Palmdale, California. So a little bit more um, backdrop on the problem itself. So U.S. schools in general um, annually are underfunded by $150 billion. Um, and this is actually a gap too. There's something we call the funding gap where some schools are really well funded and a lot of schools are severely underfunded. And this is often along the line of social economic status and minority status. Um, right now the top three states in the United States that would need the most investment to meet average test scores are uh, California, Texas and Florida. So those are the areas that we're focused our research on. And also schools just spend a lot on energy use. So um, we're trying to cut the cost. Like in, for example, California spends over $700 million on energy costs for their schools. So if we are able to cut that cost, we can reinvest that into the students themselves. 
Um, there's also short-term and long-term impacts of underfunding. So short-term impacts include fewer teachers, administration, and support staff, and these staff are also less experienced. There's also a more restrictive curriculum, so they'll have less classes in arts, music, physical education, language, and social studies, and they also have just poor infrastructure. And some long-term impacts would be just um, it would increase dropout rate if they have inadequate education, which would then bring their edu educational achievement down and perpetuate the low socioeconomic status of the community and reduce mobility. Uh, finally, we wanted to touch on some of the environmental concerns. So, you know, just climate change in general. Uh, schools in the United States account for 11% of energy consumption and 4% of emissions. Okay, so we also want to show why we are choosing to support the direct ownership model for schools. And so some of the pros are that the school will receive the entirety of electricity savings and rebates. Uh, they will be able to retain renewable energy certificates, which um, this is important for allowing the schools to make claims about its environmental practices. Uh, direct ownership also allows for savings uh, from lowered energy costs uh, to be used towards repaying loans at for the upfront costs. And uh, probably the most important benefit is that the school will be able to retain its autonomy over its energy situation. Uh, this does, however, mean that all the performative risks will be taken on by the school. The school will, of course, have to uh, deal with the expensive upfront costs and will be responsible for the operation and maintenance. When it comes to third-party ownership, there are some pros and cons as well. Because an outside solar company would be more involved, this alleviates the high upfront capital investment required for a project of this scale, and the responsibility is not on schools for taking care of operation and maintenance of the panels. Additionally, energy prices would be predictable for a set time period, and tax breaks would be available when funding the project. On the other hand, the electricity would have to be bought back by the school, so it's not free as it would be in a direct ownership model. And schools wouldn't be able to claim themselves as green institutions, which is one of the additional benefits that comes with having a solar system on school property. All right, so now we're going to show you our business model canvas for our fictional firm, which is called Energy Efficient Education. So to get our project started, we're going to need uh, consultants in solar energy and finance to provide guidance to our school's administration as well as outreach and don donor relation coordinators. And in terms of funding, we're gonna need initial investment to purchase components and install our microgrid. Um, so getting into partners and key stakeholders, some of the uh, partners that we would have are um, donors, which is how we get a lot of our money, as well as taxpayers in the government, which was how we would get the rest of the money. Um, in addition, we have the stakeholders, which would be the people at the elementary school, including students, staff, and faculty. Um, there would be district implications um, with the school system that the elementary school is located in, um, as well as the environment and globe, um, because the uh, production of electricity using our solar panels would not emit any carbon. Um, in addition, re in regards to the cost structure, um, so taking into some, uh, sorry, taking into account some assumptions, um, as well as the high solar irradiation of the Los Angeles area, um, solar panels would cost a little more than two hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars. As our company grows, we would hope to continue our work and do solar panels throughout elementary schools in the entire district, which would cost about two point five million dollars for all of the elementary schools including the one um, that we focused a lot of our research on in the Palmdale School District. Um, this would alleviate financial stresses on schools more effectively because um, schools tend to be allocated funding by district. So the key activities that our um, organization will be looking at are fivefold. First, um, we're helping schools apply for their own grant applications because we want them to have autonomy throughout this entire process. So anything that um, we're not able to help them apply for and research for, we're going to try to cover um, on our end of it. Um, so we also would be overseeing the planning and installation process, running donor and liaison to attract and maintain our donors, um, and then doing some public outreach campaigning to reach potential schools that we would help. And then finally, we wanted to partner with universities to develop the educational programs we mentioned earlier on sustainability that would then be offered to the schools. And this could even be just on a really small scale, 
for example, there's an elementary school that converted to solar energy and was using their solar data to teach fractions to their students. Okay, and so the type of intervention we plan on implementing will be a service, and this will be in the form of financial aid and consultation. For channels, our nonprofit would rely on both word of mouth within the community, as, as well as social media campaigns to spread information about our services and answer any questions people may have. We would have a dedicated social media and public outreach staff member that could be scaled up over time. Regarding surplus, the high profits generated from these projects would be allocated towards reinvestments back into the schools for educational improvements and in future projects by our nonprofit. Educational improvements include things like more robust STEM curriculum, increased teacher salaries, among other things. Okay, and for segments, uh, the main beneficiary uh, from our program, we want to be schools located in low property value regions that uh, as a consequence of the way public schools are funded in the U.S., uh, these remain consistently underfunded. Um, our customers, or who we expect to pay, includes the government, nonprofit orgs, and as mentioned before, donors. Um, so for our revenue, um, this is going to be variable depending on where and when we're doing our project because we're relying a lot on donors and then also on grants and subsidies. So on average, we're assuming we're going to get about 50% of our funding from each of these. Um, for donors, we're looking at corporate donors, private donors, charities, foundations, and then uh, monthly contributors that would be interested in helping these communities become more sustainable and just promoting a more sustainable um, country planet, you know. And then in terms of grants and subsidies, these would be at various government levels. So there's state ones and federal ones and probably local ones as well. And then there's also nonprofit grants. So just a couple examples on the federal level, we have the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office, which offers a lot of different options, including the Sunny Awards for Equitable Community Solar, which would be um, an award of $100,000 to a community solar project that promotes equitable distribution of benefits of solar energy, which is exactly what we're doing. And if we're looking at a more state level, um, the California Office of Public School Construction um, offers several different ways to help fund projects, including uh, Proposition 39 through the Clean Energy Act and modernization grants. There's also the um, Inflation Reduction Act, which would offer a credit that could cover up to 30% of the installation cost. Um, and also in this section, you can't see it, uh, but we wanted to address that any excess energy that is being produced and not used by the schools could be sold back to the grid for a profit, but that profit would be exclusive to the schools and not come back to our organization. All right, so on to our value proposition. So for our beneficiaries, our project will provide improved educational quality, decreased energy expenses, as well as an additional revenue stream, which they would receive from selling excess energy back to the main grid. Um, and we base our impact measures on short and long-term goals. Uh, we want that in the short term, uh, this will allow for schools to provide more for their students, like scholarships, school supplies, learning opportunities. And in the long term, we hope to expand the availability of uh, capital for schools to transition and own their energy systems. And that at the same time, we're expanding student interests in the field of sustainability. So ultimately, from our contribution, our customers will receive both a better ability to provide for their students, faculty, and community, as well as a greater financial independence. There are several environmental and ethical considerations associated with our project as well. Uh, for example, uh, silicon and lithium are key resources for creating solar panels and batteries, but they have a finite supply. In addition, the mining process can be unsafe for workers. Another ethical consideration is ensuring that the community being assisted has autonomy in the entire decision-making process, that schools are properly informed of cost and upkeep information, and kids and their parents are communicated with respect and transparency. So for the sustainability complex, we fall into um, four of these, like specifically. Um, so starting at the individual level, we're introducing kids to sustainable concepts at a young age, which as we know is uh, really important. We learned that from the field trip where we went to, soil reclamation um, area. But um, 
yeah, we want to reach these kids when they are still developing their core interests and personality. Um, we also want to improve general health in these communities um, for individuals by reducing emissions and improving air quality. And then we're enhancing individuals' educational attainment, which then leads to the household level. Here we're looking at cross-generational engagement in education and sustainability through discussions that uh, the students' children might have with the rest of their family. And we're also looking at long-term improvements in economic mobility uh, due to the increased educational achievements. All right, so moving up to the community level, uh, we will improve educational prospects for community members, decrease their dependence on energy firms, and increase ov overall sustainability. And finally, on a global scale, our work will reduce CO2 emissions to mitigate global climate change. Um, and uh, we hope that our program will help meet the goals of one, no poverty, quality education, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation and infrastructure, reduce inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. We have a few notes on feasibility too. Um, when it comes to the changing US political climate, um, there could be times when administrations are in favor of renewables and take a more science-based policy approach. And for us, uh, during that time, it would be possible to rely more on subsidies, grants, and rebates to fund projects thanks, thanks to government initiatives incentivizing renewable energy. When administrations are in opposition to these values, they may let funding opportunities expire and harbor fear that renewable energy will be too expensive or cause job loss when it's actually quite the opposite. Um, and then just getting into some other potential things that would help or hurt our feasibility. Um, hopefully innovations in solar energy would decrease our costs over time. Current costs are high, but investments in innovations would hopefully decrease that cost and make it more um, reliable and sustainable. Um, in addition, the project would sadly become more expensive in areas that get less sunlight and have a lower solar irradiation level um, because more panels would be required to generate the same amount of energy. Um, this can be good or bad, but funding via donorship and government grants and subsidies will vary year by year. So some years we may get a lot of donations and funding, um, whereas in other years we may not get a lot. Um, so revenue is not guaranteed. Um, there are also potential supply chain concerns with regard to the sheer number of solar panels that would need to be ordered. This ranges from 500 to 600 solar panels with a school um, like the one that we researched. Um, and getting that many solar panels may take a long time after the um, initiation of the project. Um, finally, the school may not have a usable area to install solar panels because of infrastructure issues. All right, do we have any questions? So I definitely wanna, I wanna first say thank you so much for the great presentation. Well done. Um, I wrote down a question about the like, I have to write them down or else I forget. Anyway, um, you did mention in your feasibility that they might not get revenue or the schools themselves. Is that my, was I understand correctly? That they might not get uh, like revenue from the solar panels and selling? No, it was more in regards to grants and subsidies. Um, they may not always be, like applications may not always be accepted. Um, they may not be available depending on like who's in office or um, like if they've expired. Um, as well as um, just like, it, it would be more about like the funding for the solar panels than less about our specific profits. Okay, great. Then my question is like, uh, do you know approximately how long a school would need to like produce, like gain financially from using your guys' system? Uh, the hope is that the school would be able to start producing revenue immediately, hoping, hoping that they wouldn't have to pay for anything because we would either cover the remaining costs or grants and subsidies would cover all the costs. 
Um, but uh, there would be some variation, obviously, throughout the year, depending on if it's like cloudy or nighttime, then they may need to buy from the grid a little bit versus uh, like in the summer when a place like LA is getting a lot of sun, they may be generating a lot of revenue, especially when um, the school isn't using a lot of that electricity because of like summer break. I have two questions from Jake at the university. So the first question is, why did you choose solar energy for the project? Um, so the first consideration was like what um, is already feasible right now. Um, and there are a lot of schools in the United States. Like if you just Google um, school switches to solar, you'll find lots and lots of articles about schools that are already doing this. So you know this is something that we could uh, feasibly attain uh, sometime in the next few years. Uh, and also other forms of energy um, have their drawbacks. So like if we were looking at wind energy, those turbines can produce like uh, sound frequencies that we can't hear, but that can cause psychological distress. So we don't want to put that in a school, that kind of consideration. Uh, second, check it, se second question from Jake is, do you think other energy options could be considered for schools? Uh, yeah, I definitely think that other options could be considered for schools. Um, I think that solar is definitely the easiest to manage. We had those that pros and cons list of like direct management by the school versus third party management. And I think that um, direct management um, using solar panels was going to be the easiest option in the United States. Um, but just looking at renewable energy in the United States, you have regions that are more um, using hydropower, like for example, my university actually runs its own, um, well, I don't know if they run it, but um, they just completed a hydropower project on the river that we live nearby. Um, so that could be feasible for certain areas, as well as um, like other areas may have a lot of wind energy, but um, like you said, there are problems with putting a wind turbine super close to a school. Um, so solar seemed to be the most feasible to start off with, but we would look into expanding to other forms of renewable energy. <laughs> Thank you. And I have a question online um, from Melissa, and it is, what would be the first step? Uh, what would be the first steps you would do to start, and what is the biggest challenge you foresee? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so since we've already selected the school that we wanted to target and the area and the type of clean energy, our first step would be to secure funding. Uh, so this, like was said, we would do through grants, through subsidies, and through donors. So that would definitely need to start in the beginning because we need that as an additional uh, investment in order to uh, create our microgrid. Um, so could you remind me of the other part of the question? Uh, what was the biggest challenge you foresee? Okay, uh, the biggest challenge, like was mentioned, uh, revenue that we receive from the grants and from the subsidies can be a little unpredictable, depending on how much they're offering and if our application is rejected or accepted, as well as how many grants are available to begin with in the first place. Uh, I think it's kind of hard to predict what our biggest challenge might be. I also was thinking um, trying to train uh, people in maintenance of their solar farms might be difficult, but I am not a solar expert, so I really don't like know exactly how difficult that's going to be. Um, I think community to community is going to be different, too, based on how receptive people are to wanting to learn about this. So getting people in on the idea could also be a challenge. Uh, great, thank you so much. I think that's time for questions, unless someone has a quick one here. Nope, sweet. Thank you guys so much. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> sweet. So, next up is the future of hydrogen fuel in aviation.
Okay, cool. You good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, this is the future of hydrogen fuel in aviation, and we are the fuel fighters. So I'm Julia from U of R. I'm a junior in environmental science. My name is Kaylin. I'm a senior in aerospace engineering at San Diego State University. My name is Hannah Wen. I'm a junior in aerospace engineering at NC State. <laughs> and my name is Marina Williams. I'm a senior at San Diego State University studying industrial organizational psychology. Okay, so um, here's just a quick outline for today. We have our problem, the golden circle, our sustainability models, the business model, advantages and disadvantages, and the conclusion. So, um, our first slide here is our problem. So, the aviation industry is massive globally, and um, daily there are 795 million liters of oil used, um, and with 3.16 kilograms of carbon dioxide emitted per one kilogram of fuel, that is an immense amount of emissions daily. Um, and we're not just emitting carbon dioxide, it's also nitrogen oxide, uh, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, and sulfur dioxides. Um, and aviation does not actually contribute to um, a super large percentage of the world's emissions, um, but it's still significant. And it also um, is 3.5% of effective radio forcing, which is a better measure for um, whether or not something will contribute to global warming. And then um, one thing that's important to note is that international flights specifically are not included in the Paris Agreement, and also countries are not responsible for counting international flights emissions towards their um, records, so there's less of an incentive um, to use green fuel. And here we just have a very quick graph um, that shows kind of what I just talked about. Uh, the red line is um, tons of carbon dioxide released by aircraft. It dipped in the financial crisis and COVID, but it's continuously going up about 5% a year. And then towards the bottom, we just have aviation as a share of global CO2 emissions. Same, it's increasing. And then we have our lovely golden circle, which is not, in fact, the Iceland tourist destinations, which I thought it was. Uh, so I'm just going to do the why really quick. Um, so our why is that decarbonizing aviation is important. Like I mentioned, air travel is going to increase, and we can all pretty much agree that um, decreasing, carbon, uh, decreasing greenhouse gases um, will reduce the impact of climate change. The technology we're about to propose will be helpful not just for aviation, but all around. Um, challenging countries to hold themselves accountable is very important. Um, and effective change is the sum of its individual actions. So even though uh, it's only a small fraction of the global emissions, it is still important. So now getting to how can we decarbonize aviation. So looking at one way is using hydrogen as a fuel. So the current aircraft fuel or the most popular aircraft fuel is kerosene. Uh, kerosene is made of carbon and hydrogen. And when you burn carbons, carbon dioxide is always created as a byproduct. And so one way to think about it is if you burn less fuel, you produce less carbons. Um, current trite solutions are something called sustainable aviation fuels or SAFs. They're still carbon-based fuels, um, and they produce the same emissions, but those emissions are offset by the manufacturing process of those fuels. Um, and another way that we can look at decarbonizing aviation is looking to use hydrogen as a fuel. And so hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Um, it has about 2.5 more energy per kilogram than kerosene. It does produce a lot of water vapor, which does contribute to global warming, but water vapor doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long. I think it stays up to a year, versus CO2 can stay in the atmosphere for, I think, up to 100 years. And so when trying to look at using hydrogen as a fuel, there are two different ways to utilize this. Um, liquid hydrogen fuel or a hydrogen fuel cell. So liquid hydrogen fuel is a liquid combustible fuel. Um, and it's good for long-range aircraft, like commercial flights or international flights. And then looking at a hydrogen fuel cell, um, the engine uses the fuel cell to convert hydrogen into electricity that is then used to power a propeller. And that's better for short-range aircraft, so regional flights, domestic flights, and service aircraft. 
For this presentation, we're going to be focusing on commercial aircraft, um, specifically international flights. So therefore, we'll be looking at um, liquid hydrogen fuel and not the hydrogen fuel cell. So current progress, Iceland Air currently has two different projects going on. Um, one with universal hydrogen to produce a hydrogen conversion kit for the Dash 8 aircraft. And then another project with Hart Aerospace for regional electrical air electric aircraft. Um, but in this presentation, we want to focus on using hydrogen fuel in long range aircraft, like I mentioned earlier. So looking at international flights and therefore looking at using liquid hydrogen fuel. Um, but, sorry, <laughs> one of the big uh, questions is, yes, hydrogen fuel, it is more sustainable, but how do you get that hydrogen through that fuel? And can you get that hydrogen in a sustainable way? So we do have a sustainable idea, but as Kaylin mentioned, we do want to be sustainable th thoroughly throughout our process. So this brings us to the what, which is producing green hydrogen fuel using electrolysis. So what it is essentially is an electron current is sent through um, a liquid to stimulate a non-spontaneous reaction. So this would help with creating zero uh, greenhouse emissions. And it's going to be used to separate substances. So in this case, it'd be used to sub to separate <laughs> sorry, hydrogen and oxygen. And this would take place in something called an electrolyzer. And those can range from either being really small, like appliance size, to either really big on a mass scale. So for us, what we'd be proposing is the idea, but through um, something very large. Um, but typically, what e electrolysis is powered by is coal. But in our case, we'd want to utilize wind power, which Hannah will speak about next. All right, so how do we do this on a large production scale? So there's something called the proton exchange membrane or the PEM electrolyzer, which is the part in the middle here as labeled. And so how this works is that a high density current will run through the system and it pressurized water will come in through these pipes and the water will come in and react at the anode and then the oxygen will flow out of the system where the hydrogen can pass the membrane and react at the cathode and exit the system um, as hydrogen gas. So PEM is very ideal because it works well with intermittent energy sources like wind energy. And um, it is a special plastic material that only certain gases can pass through. So that's why oxygen can stay on one side of this system while hydrogen will pass on and be collected at the end. So the entirety of the process is shown in this picture. So it'll start with wind energy, and then the energy will be converted through turbines into electricity. And then the water will enter the system using industrial water or groundwater. And then the water will undergo filtration. So think of like a Brita. All the minerals will be filtered out and have water in its purest form. Then it will enter the electrolyzer where, where the oxygen and hydrogen will be separated. Then the hydrogen will leave and uh, be transported into uh, a place where the temperature will drop for the hydrogen to liquefy it. So it'll have to drop to around 20 Kelvin or negative 253 Celsius in order to liquefy. And in order to maintain the hydrogen in the liquid form, it will have to be stored in insulated tanks uh, like the one pictured. But ideally, it will be more spherical tanks because spherical tanks are more ideal for keeping the hydrogen away from the ground from heat in general. Because if it is, um, if the temperature is risen, it will go back into the gaseous form, and that is not ideal. Um, and then also, these tanks will be double walled. So if any hydrogen is leaking from the inside, there will be a secondary wall for safety concerns. And um, we don't want hydrogen to enter their environment. And also, um, the double wall design will also help with a, a vacuum insulation. So think of the insulation of a thermos. Um, the vacuum insulation will keep that um, temperature regulated for transportation to other sectors like aviation. So these are the sustainable development goals that we want to hit. So there's good health and well-being, decent work and economic growth, in the industry innovation and infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action and partnerships for the goals. So essentially this, we want to be a internationally implemented process and it will definitely connect different cities, different communities um, through green hydrogen. 
So another way to visualize this is our sustainability complex. Um, so just going top down um, on a global scale, uh, carbon dioxide and gr other greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere, which is the earth, which we all live on. And then there's also global e agreements, uh, global trade, global industry, uh, and new economic opportunities. On a national level, you have airlines, um, things like the Federal Aviation Administration, um, so law, and then also opportunities for economic growth. Um, regionally, you have uh, airports and un further airlines. Um, and then city and community coming together um, could have uh, could be for production for the industry and also um, boosting jobs and the local economy. And then on an individual level, um, not dying or having health complications from greenhouse gas emissions or climate change is nice, I guess. <laughs> okay. All right, so the big one. <laughs> so this is our, so our social business model canvas for uh, the fuel fighters. Uh, so for our key resources, we of course have the government and in communities that support the use of hydrogen fuel, so that could be on a local scale. And then also with the help of Iceland's environmental minister, for partners and key stakeholders, we have that broken down a little bit. So again, the government, but with our stakeholders, mostly turbojet manufacturers and fuel producers who would be working with more directly. And then they would be selling directly um, in sense with partnerships with major airlines and producers, which include Airbus, for example, Iceland Air and American Airlines. Um, for our key activities, our big goal, again, is to sell the technology since this is our patent technology that we are selling. So coordinating technology with manufacturers and in partnerships with airlines to accommodate for the new fuel. For our cost structures, we're looking for investments from private equity firms more on the Icelandic side. But in the U.S., utilizing the Biden-Harris administration funding, which is about $750 million, towards um, accelerating clean hydrogen technologies. The type of invention we have, again, is an industry product, and our channels would be petitioning through governments that aren't so flexible, which wouldn't necessarily be Iceland, but maybe the US. <laughs> um, having a strong social media presence, speaking directly to hydrogen power plants and major airlines. And then with our surplus, we'd be looking to reinvest in future projects on implementation and future research of hydrogen fuel. Okay, for segments, we have uh, manufacturers as our beneficiaries, and our customers will be commercial airlines such as Iceland Air and American Airlines. They've already shown interest in um, investing in hydrogen fuel research, so that is a great. Um, then there is value proposition, so fly more efficiently while also reducing CO2 emissions, and then we want to use social media and outreach to communicate, poll, and analyze changing opinions and impact of our project and hopefully we can reach zero net emissions goal through our product. And then for revenue, we would license our patent rights um, by earning a percentage of royalties. So as with every type of project, there are some disadvantages and advantages. So for the disadvantages, um, like we mentioned earlier, this may create pollutants and carbon dioxide, but through the electrolysis process, we're hoping to eliminate any pollutants that do come out of trying to create hydrogen for liquid hydrogen fuel. Um, liquid hydrogen is very flammable and extremely, it escapes the environment very easily. Um, and so therefore that leads to it being very expensive to ship and transport. It liquefies at about 20.25 Kelvin, which means that it boils off very easily. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know, but the NASA Artemis mission, that rocket used liquid hydrogen as its fuel. And one of the reasons that it had to keep delaying its rocket mission was because that they kept having hydrogen leaks. And so um, leaking hydrogen is a very, very serious problem. And also it requires extremely high pressure tanks and a hydrogen refueling system. And then also it has a lower volumetric density, so therefore it needs four times the volume on an aircraft um, than current jet fuel, which is kerosene. And so you'd have to redesign the aircraft to accommodate for that larger space that it needs to take up. And although there are disadvantages, there are also many advantages. So just recapping all that, it is an economy promoter with creating more jobs within this sector. Completely renewable, but only through electrolysis, which um, 
we mentioned before. Hydrogen also has high energy density. Burning hydrogen produces 90% less nitrogen oxides than kerosene, which is most commonly used. It has the lowest explosive energy per unit of stored fuel when compared to natural gas, which is also most commonly used. It's a great solution for remote communities who do not have access to the grid. And it also helps specifically in aiding Iceland's transition to emitting fossil fuels, which is their phase three in their energy plan and creating a more greener, sustainable environment. So yeah, just to conclude, um, overall what we want to do is we want to replace carbon-based aviation fuels with a greener alternative, which in this case is liquid hydrogen fuel. Um, we want to do this by using the electroly electrolysis process to produce that green hydrogen and then use that as that liquid combustible fuel um, to use in Iceland's air's long-range and hopefully short-range aircraft. Like we've been learning about um, this past week, Iceland is currently trying to um, undergo their third energy transition. So investing in hydrogen fuel and other types of sustainable fuels um, will be particularly helpful for the transportation industry, which also they're looking at. Um, our goal primarily be to patent our technology and then also then market it to investors. And it also has the potential to open or really promote a new industry for progressive thought in the world of sustainable practices. <laughs> and uh, these are our references. We got a lot. <laughs> and then that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. Very interesting. Um, my first question is um, about like how long you can fly using hydrogen fuel. Is it the same uh, or similar in comparison to what is used now, or does it like decrease how far you can travel? <laughs> um, I think it measures to be about the same. It is a lighter fuel, and so I think, therefore, it is a little bit more efficient. And so I think you might be able to get more uses out of it. I think when looking at short-range aircraft, I looked at it. It was like a number for, like, you use it basically up to the same amount of time that you use kerosene for, like, the short-range aircraft. So they do compare, but I think ker hi liquid hydrogen or hydrogen fuel cells for short-range aircraft, they're much more efficient, so therefore they can be used up to many more times. Um, a question from Jake at the university is, do you plan on producing hydrogen at airports or transporting it to the airports for use? Do you want to have an answer? Um, I guess regarding safety concerns, it would be best to have them not near the airports, especially if we're doing wind energy, it would definitely um, interfere with air traffic. So I would say that like developing those um, safe insulated tanks would be ideal and then transporting it to the airports. Um, so this might be something that you hadn't looked into, but um, something that I've definitely heard and you touched upon. Um, how, n like necessarily, how explosive or dangerous could the liquid hydrogen fuel be? Um, because I think that's like, if you have it in an aircraft, would the aircraft likely need um, to be modified or could it be used in aircraft as they are? That's pretty specific, but just interested. Um, so it is pretty dangerous, but I wouldn't say <laughs> like, it's not more dangerous than like, other types of fuel, it's like combustible, so it does its job, but I think the biggest thing in terms of redesigning an aircraft would just be that it has a more bigger volumetric density, and so the fuel just takes up more space. And so you would have to redesign your aircraft to accommodate that, um, to have it take up more space. But in terms of safety, I don't think there's much difference in the current aircraft. I think just liquid hydrogen alone and being transported by itself is very, like we said, 
flammable and so therefore to transport it all over the place is going to need some like new safety type of transporting mechanisms um but as far as being implemented inside an aircraft hopefully with the redesign of an aircraft which companies are looking into they would account for those safety measures i can i can (laughs) um i don't know if you had time to look into this with the scope of your project but i noticed that you guys were thinking about using industrial uh water wastewater is am i correct Okay. Yeah, so I, I looked up more into what industrial water really means. So essentially, it's what factories mostly just use already to create their products. So it's like using the same sources uh, for the water and then groundwater as well. It's just, uh, it's not looking at salt water options right now because that's a whole nother filtering process uh, that could be more costly. So yeah, that is. And the last question also from Jake is, do you know of any other companies working in this field currently? Yeah, um, so uh, reading across different articles, uh, definitely Iceland Air, like we mentioned, they have two projects going on. American Airlines has a project going on, and American Airlines is a airline company, but then we also looked at manufacturing companies. Airbus has a project going on. I think Boeing is looking to invest in cities. And then with these um, aircraft manufacturers like Boeing and Airbus, they also partner with engine manufacturers like Rolls-Royce. And I think there is a, another engine maker. I want to say Pratt & Whitney. I don't think they make engines though. It's another engine maker outside of Rolls-Royce, but they also partner with those engine makers as well. Um, the Universal Hydrogen Company, I think we mentioned a couple times in the presentation, um, they're the main company we saw that is doing things similar to what we want. Although, um, so they're looking into producing hydrogen fuel and putting it into aircraft. Although, um, I think what we brought to the table was the addition of like wind powered electrolysis. So similar yet a little different. Actually, just one more question from Melissa online. What are the benefits of using hydrogen fuel than what is already on the market? Waste, organics, oil, carbon captured air, et cetera. Yeah, I guess I can talk about at least the two things on the market is the current jet fuel, like kerosene. Um, And so, like you mentioned earlier, hydrogen is lighter and it's more efficient. um, And it doesn't produce all the CO2 emissions if you use green hydrogen. So that's probably the biggest benefit from that. Um, And then I think there was something that I mentioned that they try to implement, which is sustainable aviation fuel, which is carbon-based. But overall, it still produces CO2, maybe a little bit less, but it still produces CO2 versus just liquid hydrogen. There's no CO2 emissions when you do it through the electrolysis process. Um, And I want to add that, I guess... I looked up a lot of different processes like those, and it seemed that water and electrolysis was, I guess, the easiest way to create uh, alternative fuel in abundance. So, like, um, and especially water is a renewable resource that we can definitely utilize and is more um, accessible, I guess. So that's why. I also think um, hydrogen fuel just gives you a lot more for what you're producing, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, A lot of the other fuels that were mentioned are interesting, but probably would be better suited for land vehicles or stuff that's not like international flights where you're flying long distances and need a lot of power. Okay. Okay. Oh, again, thank you so much for the great presentation. Oh, oh. And then uh, Brian Power Systems is up next. (laughs) 
Okay, hello everyone. Today we are going to be presenting to you our new company, Brine Power Systems, also known as BPS, where we will be using desalination for molten battery storage. And today the presentation will be done by Brendan, Daniel, myself, Gianna, Jackie, and Will. All right, and here's the agenda of what our presentation will cover. And we'll start off with the problem that inspired us to go into deeper diving into research of what we want to create. Well, um, there's a huge problem regarding uh, the human impact uh, on the wet wetlands, so we don't have any more the same capability nature-wise to capture water uh, to help the w cycle of water. Uh, therefore, we have a lack of water in a lot of places in the world. There's around 4 billion people, 2 to 4 billion people with lack of, ac lack of access of tap water. So this is mainly the way we're approaching it. Besides that, uh, there's more children killed by um, getting sick due to uh, dirty water than bullets. So that's uh, pretty impressive. So the current solution to this problem is um, desalination plants. We're not creating a new thing here. Um, desalination plants are available in a few different countries, but the problem is that they take the byproduct, which is brine, and just dump it back into the ocean, which can be very toxic for marine environments because of the increased salinity. And besides that, the problem with these plants is that they're very energy intensive and because of that, very expensive. And most of them are being powered by fossil fuels, which obviously has a bad impact on the environment. All right, and this is where we come in. So in order to power the sound nation plant, we will use solar energy to power it. And then from there, it will go through the same as that process. However, we will collect the brine that is collected here, the salt and minerals. We collect it and use it to produce the salt battery or molten salt battery. It works similar to what a lithium battery will work. So there's a cathode and anode, as well as the electrolyte and separator, where the sodium ions will go back and forth, either to recharge or discharge. And to address the golden circle as to why, why do we want to do this? We want to address the fresh water availability for water scarce countries. And we also want to effectively use the waste of desalination plants so we can create a sustainable energy storage. So again, how we're gonna do this, um, we're gonna use solar energy to power first the desalination process and then create a more circular system by using this byproduct and creating a new energy source out of the salt batteries where we'll be able to use them to power our own production and then also sell them for energy storage. So um, what are we doing? We're pretty much uh, taking a sustainably approach to the byproduct of the salination plant. Um, this is much more environmentally friendly than like lithium ion uh, uh, is uh, happening today. And uh, we're also gonna be donating millions of gallons of water um, out of this uh, process, which is gonna be pretty much giving back to our society um, in a pretty uh, efficient way. All right, just to talk more about the salt battery. Uh, some advantages of a salt battery is that since salt is more abundant than lithium reserves, it is much cheaper to make, as well as is easier to access to. And then also, since it's coming from salt, not lithium, which could burn and explode, the salt battery is considered pretty safe, which also allows it to be easy to dispose of and also recyclable. However, there are some challenges as to uh, we might face through salt batteries is that since the breakthrough of using the capacity of the salt battery is pretty recent, there hasn't been much of a commercialization as to how we can effectively use this for sustainable energy storage. And as well as producing the fresh water, we had to go through the reverse osmosis, which will allow more membranes to break down, which requires heavy maintenance to use. And as of right now, the purity of the salt that needs to be run is currently unknown, but we are hopefully going through the research and development to figure that out. Yeah, so we can start with the business model canvas. Um, so obviously we are looking to target West African countries um, and we would start with the local governments there to become intertwined with them. 
Um, in terms of our solar power infrastructure, we would need help with Renewable Energy Company to help set up uh, such a large scale uh, solar farm. In terms of just generating local market awareness before we actually get this process on board, we would look to look to work with uh, NGOs in the local community um, just so that they become aware of the distribution of the water that we will be planning to distribute. Um, and then in terms of funding, you know, green funds like the UN's Green Climate Fund or venture capitalists, things like that, um, will be huge for us to scale up a project of this size. Um, and then obviously, given that we are looking to produce actual revenues through the battery material um, itself, we're going to need to become in contact with suppliers as well. Um, and then so for key activities, obviously desalination, we're not doing anything new there where we're really differentiating ourselves is the brine collection um, and turning that into use for battery production and revenues. Um, and then in terms of key resources, the salt water itself, nothing changes there. Um, the new thing is brine byproduct instead of just dumping it back in. Um, and then obviously desalination technology is still very uh, important to our process, as well as the solar energy to keep the footprint of our plant quite low. And for some of our value propositions, so since we don't have to source our energy from non-renewables or from another company, we actually get to produce our own energy and don't have to pay for that after we've installed the infrastructure. In addition, as we said before, since we don't need to source any brine to build the battery, we have that from our byproduct of the desalination. In addition to that, for the locals who are in these communities, they no longer have to spend time searching for water or worrying about that because we'll be supplying more than double what they demand each day. In addition to that, we'll be selling about 20% of the batteries we produce from our brine and molten salt batteries, and that will produce an insane amount of revenue to be able to cover everything else. And then, obviously, with desalination, we'll be providing potable water to 2.5 million families. And then some of the costs associated with that are the capital expenditure involved in building the desalination plant, the battery plant, and the solar panels, and some of the maintenance involved with that as well as research and development to increase the efficiency and to be able to scale this project out. For some of the societal costs and environmental costs, there is still metal mining involved in the process of creating these batteries as well as some intensive energy use for the mining involved in that. And societal costs, there are still cultural attachments to gathering water in West Africa. So a lot of women, they travel for miles to get water. And although this process doesn't sound awesome for them to do, it's sort of an escape from some of the situations they have at home. And they would lose that if they had immediate access to water. Um, and then for some environmental and societal gains from this, um, the access to clean water and um, Excuse me. Um, for some other things, like there's no um, electricity waste because we'll be producing our own energy and we will not be emitting too much emissions regarding carbon because we have solar panels. And furthermore, for our revenue streams, like I said, we'll be selling batteries, but there's also, at least in more affluent areas, you can actually lease batteries so they can take it for free and then pay you back monthly. Pay you back monthly so that way. Um, over the years, you can be paid back rather than a one-time payment for the battery. And then uh, to finish up, in terms of customer relationships, we want to work with both business to consumer and governments as well, but it changes relative to the product. Um, in terms of water, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking to lo work within these local communities, so we would align with the local governments to help with the distribution um, and on-site sales, but it's not even really sales necessarily related to water. As we will mention soon, it's more so donation, um, because we expect from the batteries and the business to business through our company websites and through access to international markets, that's where we'll really be making our revenues. Um, and so through channels, as I mentioned, local markets and international energy markets, and then customer segments, um, as I mentioned, water, still we're working in the low income areas and low energy access inhabitants. And I will further explain our plan with the batteries as well as we won't be selling 100% of what we produce um, simply because we don't need to. Uh, and then in terms of batteries as well, looking for high income countries with energy storage needs and we can provide access for that. So then we created cost-benefit uh, analysis, and I'll focus on the costs. So obviously the biggest parts of our project involve the construction of the desalination plant itself, construction of the battery factory, and then the nearly $90 million worth of solar infrastructure. Um, that's kind of the big basis of our project. Obviously land's a little bit cheaper in West Africa compared to more affluent areas, and so 870 acres is roughly selling for only just under $3 million, which is quite insignificant relative to the cost of this project in general. Uh, solar power, as you can see, won't cost us very much as well, um, and that's another big uh, benefit for us. 
Um, in terms of general R&D, as we mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of whole research already done with these types of batteries, so we want to expand upon that and make our process more efficient. Um, and then you just have general overhead expenses like workers. But I do want to mention we're spending um, nearly 6% of our revenue on logistics and distribution because we think that this is really important in terms of both international market access and helping distribute this water effectively. And then looking at our CBA for the benefits, most of our benefits will come from annual battery sales. Since we're selling 20% of the 4 million batteries we produce, um, that actually equates to about $2.5 billion in revenue. Um, but what comes with that is a large-scale project, which is actually going to cost about a billion to start off, which we will seek from green funds or from venture capitalists, as we stated before. And another benefit is actually our water sales, which we will make $0 off of, but we'll supply $2.5 million to West African families with about 20 gallons per day, or yeah. Um, and then looking at our profits, given the cost that we have and the revenue from these years, it's about two billion each year after the first three years that we spend actually building these um, plants and factories. Um, the way we are going to be tackling our SDGs is around uh, seven of these topics. Oh, sorry. We're going to be tackling seven our SDGs, starting from the clean water, using um, clean power uh, through the sun. We're going to be enabling storage uh, energy systems. We're going to be implementing a responsible consumption and production. Um, we're going to be having a climate action directly uh, by mitigating the, um, the mining of rare minerals that is, are used to for uh, lithium ion. Um, they're not flammable. They're a circular economy principles applied here so we can s we can see all that um, around the seven points we're going to be attacking. Um, so obviously this will benefit the indiv individual by creating a constant supply of fresh water um, in a water scarce environment so helping their general health and well-being. All right and within the community you also uh, by installing the um, environmentally friendly battery storage, it would allow citizens to be able to supplement their energy needs as well as being able to meet their uh, blackouts or any fulfill of peak demands in case of any lithium. Instead of lithium batteries, we can use the alternative source, which is the salt batteries. And then regionally, there's both uh, economical and environmental benefits to doing this. So regionally for the environment, we're not going to be dumping brine into these marine ecosystems so the fish and the coral don't have to worry about the pollution from us. And economically, these use the fact that we're using the brine that we've created from our desalination plant, it lowers the cost of the battery and it could make this project a little more scalable. In a global perspective, we're going to have uh, a decrease in the mining and exploitation of rare minerals uh, worldwide. Uh, we hope that we know the big impact environmentally uh, with this in this topic. Uh, we also will be uh, promoting the use of desalination plants worldwide and util uh, utilization of brine as a as a, as a byproduct for uh, our storage systems. And just to wrap everything up, we just want to emphasize on the bringing the clean, as accessible water into water scarce countries, um, and also serving as a solution to energy shortage and within those countries as well, especially in developing countries, uh, which most of the water scarce countries are based off of. Um, so like we said, our company BPS doesn't plan to create the desalination plants, but use this already available technology and use the byproduct um, to create a new age, powerful and energy efficient battery out of the salt um, through using the reverse osmosis design and leading straight to the manufacturing of this battery and distributing them. And lastly, due to the amount of land that we need and the amount of facilities that we need to build, it's going to take about two to three years to actually finish completing all of this infrastructure. And um, this will be an expensive process, but since we'll be able to generate a lot of revenue from battery production and sales, um, we'll be able to break even within the first year of actual operation, but not within the first three years of building this, um, these plans. And in addition, in the future, what we'd like to do is allocate a lot of money towards research and development to make either this process more efficient or more scalable so we can implement it in different communities 
either in West Africa or in other areas that have water scarcity issues. And then these are our links for everything we've researched and for images. And then these are our appendices to calculate costs and benefits. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Well, give me a second. Uh, so my first question is, uh, is anyone else currently doing this? Um, and if they are, like, what's different? And if not, why don't they use the byproducts of desalination plants? Um, <coughs> so no, um, although there are over 17,000 desalination plants already, they are not. The majority of them just dump the brine into the water because they don't see the brine as an economically effective uh, type of byproduct to even engage with. And as you can see, the feasibility of our project is kind of in question because you can see how much um, the cost of making that brine into an actual productive market um, product is quite heavy and involves a lot of technology that is only kind of half researched at this point. It's like kind of new. And to just address it, like moving forward, it's going to be obviously quite the scale and we're going to need a lot of help from funds to take a chance on something like this because in the long run, given how much um, battery technology, battery storage technology is selling for, um, it poses a serious market opportunity, um, but it's just going to take heavy investments up front. I wanted to compliment that one of the countries that has one of the biggest um, desalination plants in the world is, uh, is Qatar. They have, um, they have production around 3.5 million cubic meters of, uh, of fresh water. Um, however, they dump back the, the brine. Uh, so that affects the uh, environment heavily and um, it's not one of their priorities. However, technology is operating similar. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just waiting for some other questions. Does anyone here have a question? Oh. Um, do you guys know how much brine you will need to like produce enough batteries to meet your goals um, that you laid out? Don't want to spill that. Um, so we actually scaled out the amount of batteries we'd be able to build given the amount of brine that we produce or produce from desalinating the water. So since we'll be selling about 50, um, maybe it's in our appendix here as well, but since we'll be selling or distributing 50 million gallons of water per day, there's um, a certain amount of brine that comes out of that, and that's the exact amount that we use to create the batteries. So if you look at the appendix, you can kind of see here um, the amount of brine per liter of water produced is a ratio of 1.5 to 1. And then given how much uh, fresh water the average desalination plant produces, I kind of use that to calculate the pounds of brine. And then given the ratio of the amount of sodium that you get out of brine from that process, that purification process, I was able to calculate how many batteries we'll be able to produce at the level of 15 kilowatts per hour of storage capacity. So. I'm not sure how much you guys have considered like um, about the communities that you're going to be going into, but I was curious if you had considered like uh, how you're going to engage with the community specifically. Um, are you going to be hiring people from the local area? How can you get them in on this project so they're not resistant? Well, um, we know that definitely uh, imposing something uh, on any community or to any person is um, it, it just always has a backlash. Um, we will definitely engage locally, governments, local entities, communities, and villages. Um, at the end of the day, what we're going to be exchanging is uh, solar power uh, to provide fresh water for them. So it's going to be a, a huge balance, and we would think that we would be accepted um, as providing good for the communities. Sure, yeah, and as I mentioned, this is going to be a three-year process before we actually get onboarded, so we are going to use those three years to really engage with those communities. Um, as we mentioned, we're not going to sell the water for literally anything to them, and I think that provides them a major incentive to engage with us. Also, built upon the fact that we are actually planning on donating 80% of the batteries to West African countries, 
countries from year one just because the amount of revenue we produce is way beyond necessary relative to the um, capital that we need to launch this project from the first place and this is kind of why we chose not to list ourselves as a corporation because we don't have to answer the demands of capitalism to be constantly growing um, otherwise investors would just disinvest and we would cease to exist so we want to remain private so that we can just cover our costs provide enough for those involved in the business itself to live a well-structured life but also make sure that our social mission um, with the water and the providing of battery technologies uh, remains at the complete head front of the existence of our company itself. Great. And the last question from online is from Melissa. She says, great presentation. Um, what are some ethical considerations for this project slash the Brian Power, your company in general? I mean, when you're constructing or constructing about three plants in the middle of their home, obviously that's not aesthetic and it's something that's going to go against their traditions and something that they're used to seeing is going to be changed. And also, as I mentioned before, there's some cultural ties to actually gathering water in these countries, and what was the last part of the question? Um, in terms of ethics, I could also add the fact we calculated how many acres of solar it would be necessary for us to fund such uh, a project. It would require 870 acres, which is a lot of African land, and as we know, um, the land there tends to be something that a lot of people pride themselves on, especially since it's like one of the few natural wildernesses we have left. Um. We, we also know that um, through the use of solar panels in the ground, eventually this is just the top of the iceberg because we could be tying up these projects to uh, agriculture, to um, water, uh, solar water pumps, and provide some percentage of water for um, local, local crops so people won't be having to transport neither water or go la long distances to get a uh, minimal amount of food. Great. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Next, last but not least, carbon capture by microalgae. Ooh, green capture. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you for uh, attending our presentation today. I'm Emily. I'm joined by Lauren, Jasmine, Michael, Ian, and Jared, and we are Green Capture. We'd like to um, give you some insight into our sustainable business model that we have created. Um, why? Because we recognize that CO2 emissions, obviously from electricity generation, um, are a large part of um, carbon emissions in themselves. And we recognize that we can take the byproducts from that electricity generation and turn it into something usable. How? Um, that's going to be through the use of um, growing microalgae using bioreactors, um, which we'll get into substantially in the next slides. We will then harvest the algae that we have produced and then sell it to um, aquaponic fish farmers on a global scale. So um, just to be thinking about while we run through our presentation, uh, keep in mind these six sustainability goals um, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, responsible consumption and production, affordable and clean energy, climate action, partners for the goals, and sustainable cities and communities. We have aimed to hit all six of these with our sustainable business approach. Um, our key resources um, really involve uh, the physical resources that we'll be using in order to convert the waste products from the um, electricity generation into this microalgae. And that will include the algae itself called chlorella, carbon capture system, which will be integrated into the plant, um, light and heating systems, which will allow the micro um, algae a temperate and 
um, light sensitive environment, which they will thrive in the filtering membrane in order to harvest the algae and the uh, photobioreactor itself in which the um, algae will grow. So we chose to use chlorella algae for our system for a couple different reasons. First, chlorella algae grows very, very quickly. It grows about um, two grams per liter of water per day. Um, it also is very efficient in intaking CO2, which is important when you're trying to cut down on carbon emissions. And on top of that, chlorella algae has some benefits for aquaculture and for fish food. So it is um, has certain amino acids that are lacking in plant-based feeds and are important for fish development. It is easy for fish to digest due to high starch contents, which increases feed efficiency and decreases fish waste. And it also has been shown to increase survivability and um immune health in fish. Furthermore, there's a lot of research on chlorella algae already and its usage in both for fish food and for uh, other usages such as like biofuels. So we have a couple different uh, interventions in our system. The first is the capture of carbon coming from energy generation. The second is upcycling or utilizing waste products. So we actually have two um, upcycling circles in our project. The first is using uh, carbon capture to grow the algae. And the second is using waste heat from power generation to dry the algae so it can be shipped to our customers. And then our system also uses biosystems engineering, which is using natural systems to benefit human society. Here are the key activities for our process. First, we need to capture carbon gases from geothermal power plants. These gases will then be fed directly into our system to um, kickstart algae growth. We are going to automate the CO2 mix and LED lighting to maximize growth speed of algae. We will then harvest the algae through filtration processes and then dry the algae into a powder form. Finally, this powder will be shipped to our customers at aquaponic fish farms. All right. So I'll go over some of the, the physical structures of our system. Uh, we will be constructing two buildings per system co-located with the geothermal site. However, our building footprint is relatively small and there should be enough space at most geothermal plants. Uh, to give you an idea of the scale of our project, because it can be scaled to any geothermal plant, we decided to select a generic 100 megawatt uh, size geothermal plant, uh, typical for Iceland. The CO2 emissions of geothermal varies widely region to region, so we chose the typical Icelandic uh, emissions for a plant. So the, the core building that we have is a three-story, uh, 36,000 square foot building where the bioreactors will be held, which is where the algae will actually grow. And then we have a one story harvesting building that we'll go into next. And the flue gases from the geothermal plant will be piped directly into our growth building and will hopefully employ only 10 to 15 employees uh, due to the process being mostly automated. So within our photobioreactor growth building, we are going to have thousands and thousands of these horizontal tubes that have horizontal LEDs running along the length of them to provide the most efficient photosynthesis process possible. These LEDs will be on an automatic time cycle to simulate daylight, um, even provide faster growth than in the real world. And we will be aerating the flue gases into the water at about 10% CO2 content mixed with air to keep that constant. And this just allows the, the algae to grow like rabbits. Um, and then Every seven days, the algae is piped into the harvesting building and through a filtration membrane that allows the water to be recycled. And then this algae is dried on conveyor belts that are heated by the flue gases, uh, just the pipes coming in with the flue gases. And this allows us to use the algae as a powdered form for sale. And then this is a brief overview of our costs for the business model. We have the bioreactor system, algae processing system, and then um, debt payments on our buildings and structures. Those are our fixed costs. And then we have significantly variable costs. Uh, the biggest one is going to be research and innovation. We are only using existing technologies, but we are combining several that have not necessarily been used in conjunction before. Um, there's been a lot of research on the growth of chlorella for CO2 capture. However, to our knowledge, there's no one doing it on this large of a scale. So that will um, require a lot of money for research. And then we also have to pay for electricity, water, maintenance, and salaries and overhead for our employees. 
Um, yeah, cute. So um, here on the screen shows our initial costs. Um, on the left is for research and development and our facilities. In the middle shows those costs levelized on over a 10 year period. And then on the right is our reoccurring costs. Uh, these are costs such as like salaries and uh, utilities, harvesting and drying, and just miscellaneous maintenance. Uh, we have two main ways of gaining revenue. Uh, so far, the first and most important is for the, uh, the algae. This is just going to be fish food for aquaculture. So we will be selling our algae to fish farms. Um, and there are other future potential uses for this, uh, such as like supplements and biofuels. Um, those haven't really uh, been used as much, but we're going to look into implementing them in the future. Uh, our other way of revenue is through capturing the carbon. Um, since we, since you have to pay usually a EU credit in order to emit carbon into the atmosphere, we will offer this to plants at a lower price. That way they can choose to either get that credit or they can choose to use us in order to save some money. So over a 10 year period, we're looking at a total yearly expenses of $6 million. Um, our maximum revenue, which is working at, uh, is the model working at 100%, that's going to be $6,300,000. So we get a potential profit of $300,000 per year. So this will help fish owners because they have an increased yield um, because of the algae. The algae helps the fish to grow larger. And for power plant companies, uh, this helps them reduce carbon emissions and save some money. So it's a good win-win scenario. Um, so the way they will pay is uh, power plants will just pay a competitive carbon capture price. And aquaponic farms or supplements or biofuels, uh, they would just pay the market price for chlora algae food. Okay, so a few partners and key stakeholders are as follows. We are working directly with geothermal power plants. Um, this pro uh, like process is not really applicable to other power plants as of this time, just be due to scale. Um, but we hope that that will be possible in the future. Uh, we also have the fish farm operators who hopefully will be on board with using this kind of product that will really affect our decision making making process. And then we also have the communities that we will be building in. We want to be attentive to their wants and needs throughout this process. And then the channels that we will use to reach our consumers, we really consider like our target population being the fish farmers. So we want to create a website that holds all the information of our business plan so that it's easily accessible. And we want to use Google advertisements just because most people see them. They may not be as effective as solicitation, which we will be directly reaching our um, consumers, which would be like the most ideal process because we can present our information the best way. <clears throat> and then we will reinvest our profits back into our company so that we can eventually do this at a larger scale, uh, like coal and natural gas um, power plants. And then we also want to contribute to the research of these processes. As um, Ian said, this, these processes aren't really used together, so we want to improve that situation. So some of the externalities for our business model include uncontrolled algae blooms in a biodiverse environment may endanger other species. Cultivated algae could possibly escape into other environments, which could cause a massive shift in biodiversity plus a heavy impact on outdoor and fishing markets. However, our business green capture, the wastewater will be sterilized to avoid this. And then with algae being contained to a controlled environment, most of these externalities will be avoided. However, we will require strict shipping protocols. So on the individual level of our sustainability complex, um, we created a sustainable product for fish farming industry. At the community and neighborhood level, it creates quality jobs for locals. Um, it is a new innovative technology that will boost local economy through tourism. And there's potential algae contamination from a flush system. 
At the national and state level, it creates sustainability prestige, and at the global level, a reduction of carbon emissions applicable on the global scale. So the metrics of success regarding the value proposition for our business model include CO2 reductions on a yearly basis, carbon capture efficiency, revenue in fish food exports, and developing scalability for fossil fuel plants. And then why is our business valued? It is because it reduces CO2 emissions from thermal power plants, and it provides nutritious fish food for fish farms. And then the value that our idea provides is a profitable, beneficial use for captured carbon. And that is our business model. Thank you for listening. Wow, great presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, so my, I have a few questions, um, but my first one is what is your water source? And then also like, I think this might be a similar question is why are you using a geothermal power plant? So I think initially we're just going to be purchasing municipal water to fill the tanks. And then ideally we'll be able to recycle after the algae is flushed through the membranes. We'll continue to use that water and whatever nutrients are in it. And then the reason that we are not beginning with natural gas and coal is because uh, geothermal plants emit something on the range of 1 to 5 percent of the, the CO2 that those plants do per unit, and that means that this system would have to be massively, massively large, and we want to reduce the capital investment required up front just to get our business off the ground. Hopefully, after developing our process, making it more profitable, we can scale up to bigger plants. Um, I think another really cool thing that we came across um, in our research is that um, this kind of algae is very, um, um, how do you say it, able to grow in a harsh environment. So you can use um, even industrial wastewater or um, municipal wastewater untreated in order to um, like provide the water necessary for the system. So this can also be applied in areas that don't have access to um, excess water as Iceland does. Um, the algae are not very um, choosy in their, in their environment, as long as it's well lit. Wow, thank you so much. My initial idea is that you could potentially also use the geothermal wastewater. Uh, as a water source. Um, so uh, what is your like biggest maintenance issue that you s foresee with uh, algae growth? Uh, there's definitely potential for a broken tube or some something to go wrong in the flow of water in the system. Um, we hope to use our existing algae to regrow, but it, we may need to buy more uh, algae culture to begin with. And otherwise, we're going to need people um, on site to just monitor the growth of the algae. And if, if there's human error, we could kill off batches at a time, and that would just be uh, kind of counted as a loss. Anything else? Um, additionally, um, so th as long as the pH balance of the water is maintained, the algae are happy. So um, while they're being, um, while they're, growing they produce a lot of oxygen as well as um, they acidify their surrounding environment so we would need to add things such as um, calcium carbonate to the water and uh, deoxygenate the system um, so things of that nature will be um, very um, very difficult um, and must be maintained on a weekly basis by our employees. And then as Ian said, uh, the tubes are made of glass rather than plastic, so they are susceptible to breaks and damage. You guys spoke about spoke about like deoxygenating the or oxygenate however you pronounce that the water and killing off small batches. How would you deal with area like situations like hypoxia when there's decomposing algae in the water and it's taking up all the oxygen, and now you don't have enough algae to provide any oxygen in the water for the fish. 
So um, the way that algae would probably be used would be incorporated into other uh, fish food products or I guess it could be directly fed on top of the fish. But um, most of the research currently out there shows that you can't feed like a only algae-based diet to fish or else there is issues with health and uh, with fish size. So uh, this would make up just like a portion of the fish's total meal. So I think um, we didn't look super far into how, you know, aqua culture actually works. And, uh, but in general, I think that the farmers would make sure they put the right amount of food in to where like the fish eat all of it. Um, because like there's also on top of avoiding issues with hypoxia, there's also, you know, it increases the, or decreases costs on feeding if they are able to optimize the amount that needs to be fed to those fish. So that would not necessarily be a problem on our side. I think it's something that like the farmers would have to figure out um, and optimize over time. Um, the fish, the algae and the fish are completely separate. So we would be producing the algae and then drying it for global shipment. So the fish and the algae do not share um, any um, common space. So the question from Jake is, um, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, you recycle some of the water. So how much of the water would be recycled and how much can you recycle versus how much do you need new from the whatever water source you have? Um, to my knowledge, I think that would depend on the uh, contamination of the water based on the, the waste compounds that we're getting from the flue gases and how much of that the algae can tolerate um, because it's not a hundred percent. They can just tolerate a lot of it. And then Ideally, all of it, but that'll also, yeah, it, it depends on the membrane, and this is one of the things that we need to tweak over time in the first years of operation of our system before we're, you know, reaching 100% of production process. Does anyone else have any details to provide? Or cool. Uh, last question, Danny, did you have a question? Um, no. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Last question. Is there any other use for um, for this algae, like uh, fibers for textiles or human consumption or any other um, uses that you may know that could be feasible, like market-wise? Yeah. Do you want to? I can. Okay. Uh, so for the most, oh. so for the most part, we looked uh, mostly into like uh, there's a little bit of medical uses. Uh, for human consumption, obviously that would need to go through like a different process like FDA approval and like uh, rip more like regulating um, There's also like the potential to like dry the uh, dry the algae and then use it for like biofuels as well um, I Didn't really look too much into the details of those, but I know it is feasible just requires a another type of like post-processing if that makes sense so um, we, we did also look a little bit further into its usage as like a supplement for people and that if we were able to successfully market it as a supplement, it would uh, greatly increase the cost that we were able to sell the algae at. Currently, people already um, consume chlorella bacteria for supplements places. The uh, only issue with that, uh, like Jared mentioned, is that we would have to get like approval from different health organizations There'd be much more stringent packaging requirements, much more stringent production requirements and also on top of that our plant is producing a very large amount of uh, algae if or we believe it would be producing a very large amount of algae I think we uh, saw that we'd be producing about 1500 pounds per was that a year 1500 kilograms a day 1500 kilograms a day so <laughs> that's um we don't think it's very feasible that we'd be able to sell 1500 kilograms of chlorella supplements daily but you never know um, and then outside of that, biofuels are also a very um, popular usage for algae in an area where there's research going into that currently. Chlorella has also been, you know, looked at for that sort of technology, but we don't feel that that technology is quite mature enough to base our economic model off of it. So, but either way, we could start producing either of those things in the future, or we could dedicate some of the algae to supplements or whatever.
Uh, to tack on from what Michael said about like pricing and stuff, the reason why we chose uh, specifically like fish farms is also because of how the numbers work when it comes to processing and all of our facilities. Uh, right now, uh, for our model, we chose to sell it at uh, $10 per kilogram, which is a very, very, very low price uh, competitively. So that's like saying at like almost like worst case ish. So there's definitely a lot more potential on this side of like getting funding through, uh, what's it called? Subsidies? Yeah. Like through the initial fish farming and then eventually moving on with more of that money research wise into supplements. Great, thank you. I saw lots and lots of congratulations online on the well put together presentations and the amazing innovation that you guys have come up with. And I just wanna take a minute to say thank you so much. Such interesting projects. And um, like, I think it's crazy that you guys did all of this work in these eight days between us like forcing you up mountains and like going on a glacier and like uh, many, many things that we've been doing. So like, congratulations, that's so amazing. And like, just to think you could potentially do this and have a massive impact in the future. So I've been inspired and I hope you guys have too. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everyone watching.